it is starting to wind down. This is, of course, uh, a holiday-shortened week for financial markets, and you see it in the price action. Stocks wiggle back and forth a little bit, but ultimately don't go anywhere. The dollar wiggles back and forth a little bit and ultimately doesn't go anywhere. Bonds wiggle back and forth a little bit and ultimately don't go anywhere. So as liquidity starts to ebb, we're going to look further afield for what comes after the holidays. We focused on the euro yesterday here, and today we're going to take a look at China. This is Macro Money. I'm Ilya Spivak, head of Global Macro here at Tasty Live. And what we're going to do is, uh, having already looked at what's uh, coming up with the FOMC minutes and the PCE data out of the U.S. tomorrow, obviously FOMC minutes already out today, and as expected, no big changes, no big market moving uh, insights there. Uh, Yesterday, uh, as I just mentioned, we uh, looked further ahead to uh, Eurozone CPI data that uh, is coming up later in the week. But even after that, uh, coming up for release this weekend is some uh, critical economic activity data out of China. And it presents an interesting point of conversation because China has been an absolute basket case economically. And it bears wondering whether at some point, as markets do, they will have discounted all of the bad news and bargain hunting can commence. Now, this is a question that's been asked uh, with quite a bit of uh, enthusiasm this year. Obviously, we've seen... Uh, Chinese stocks surge, then drop, then surge, then drop around uh, stimulus uh, expectations, which ultimately were let down. And so it's a conversation that's been had and that's fizzled. But perhaps now we finally have something to hang our hat on. And this is where we uh, are going to begin the conversation here. Let's assess why is it that China has been so woefully weak? What's been going on? And whether the markets are finally done introducing the level of woe into asset prices, which of course then makes those assets attractive from a speculative perspective. The goal, after all, isn't to buy expensive, it is to buy cheap. And cheap means that Things are suffering, there's lots of pain, and nobody wants this. Which, of course, if you're looking for bargains, is exactly what you want. So, let's consider first and foremost the nature of the beast in China. And we'll go th uh, through this step by step so that we can clearly see what's going on. This is a chart of Chinese GDP growth. Uh, the red line is real GDP. The yellow line is nominal GDP. And in the bars is the spread between the two. The critical bit here is to notice that over the past six quarters, right here, so basically from the beginning of 2023 onward, what you have is a situation where China is seeing real GDP growth in the red here that is outpacing nominal GDP growth. In fact, the only quarter where you get a little bit of a pop is the fourth quarter of, uh, of 2022 into the first quarter of 2023. It sort of shows up right here. And where you get that is, of course, the jettisoning in China of zero COVID restrictions. But you can see that already going into the tail end of 2021, where real uh, GDP is running below nominal and indeed everything is surging as we come out of COVID, this spread starts narrowing and narrowing and narrowing and narrowing. And already into the fourth quarter turns slightly negative, then rebounds. But this state of affairs is where we are currently. And 
This is actually an incredibly damning chart. Here's why. Real GDP is supposed to be the actual value of the goods and services produced in the economy minus the influence of inflation. So when you add up all of the value, you then take out inflation to say, well, the value would be inflated higher than it would normally look. Were you to include inflation, let's take inflation out to give us a real sense of how much the economy, quote unquote, the real economy is growing. That nominal bit that includes inflation is nominal GDP growth. That's the yellow line there. So just on the basis of first or second grade arithmetic, if nominal GDP includes inflation, then real GDP is nominal minus inflation. And if real is above nominal, then that inflation coefficient is negative. The only way you get to nominal GDP being below real GDP growth is if inflation is negative and so nominal minus inflation is a larger number. And the only way you do that is if you subtract from nominal a negative inflation co uh, coefficient which tells you there is economy-wide deflation in China for the past six quarters. Now, what does that mean? Well, normally, if there's demand for goods and services, obviously there's a finite amount of them available for uh, consumption at any given time, more is always made. When there's growth, then uh, the amount of goods and services made grows. That's what GDP growth is. But at any given moment, there's a finite amount that's ready to be consumed at every level. So if there's growth in demand, that growth in demand gives you positive inflation as people, uh, businesses, entities, institutions, you name it, compete for the available supply of stuff. And of course, the only way they can compete is on the price. Whoever is going to pay is going to get the stuff. So under normal conditions, if there is demand, there is positive inflation. If there is not positive inflation, essentially the entire economy has been relegated to the bargain bin. It is on discount. The only reason why prices would be getting slashed is if there's not demand at the price and prices need to be slashed to try to get that demand to happen. And for six consecutive quarters, it's not happening. The negative quotient is changing from quarter to quarter. But nevertheless, the negative quotient persists, which tells you we haven't discounted enough yet because there is no demand in China's economy to speak of. Now, they've attempted to fight this issue with ever escalating bits of monetary stimulus. They've cut interest rates. They've reduced banks' reserve requirement ratios to make more capital available to be lent out and to make that lending cheaper. Uh, they've uh, moved to let municipal governments work down their uh, debts so they can spend more. Uh, they've introduced direct capital uh, injections into financial markets, including outright purchases of stock to try to get more money in the hands of corporates and try to boost sentiment. They've tried all manner of things to uplift the flagging housing market, which is the main investment destination uh, for the Chinese population to try to get consumer confidence rebuilt so that people buy stuff. None of it's worked. In fact, uh, a uh, survey from the People's Bank of China recently showed that household bank deposits are at a record. Basically tells you people are just hoarding the money. They're not spending it. 
And so what you see here as a kind of catch-all indicator is the Bloomberg Credit Impulse Index for China, and all this does is measure the share of new loans in GDP. And what you see here is we are at the weakest that we've been since 2018 overall. That's the red line of the index. But the growth rate is actually even more staggering because, as you can see, the yellow bars, the year-on-year -year bars, they're negative and getting more negative. So as of October, the share of new loans in GDP fell by a whopping 14.5% year-on-year, which would be the fastest contraction since February of 2022, the heart of COVID. So the very generous monetary largesse that has been uh, heaped upon the Chinese economy is very plainly failing to do anything about the woeful demand situation. Inducements are essentially not working. This is how you have uh, everybody get so excited every time that maybe it sounds like there could be some fiscal stimulus and local Chinese markets get all hot and bothered and surge only for that not to happen. And then everybody backs away. As a matter of fact, uh, foreign capital is running away in stampede-like fashion. This is foreign direct investment. And uh, you can see that as of October, foreign direct investment fell by 29.8% year on year, which is a staggering speed. Perhaps the only scarier thing is that this was an improvement because in August is where you have the recent uh, peak here where foreign direct investment fell by 31.5%, which is shocking. Money basically can't flee China fast enough. Now, you did have a recent pop in exports, which got everybody all excited. This was it right here, uh, over 12% uh, year-on-year rise in exports. By the way, we can see imports continue to uh, be sub-zero here in uh, the latest numbers, which means domestic demand is essentially not there. But imports surging uh, here at the fastest pace since this attempted recovery, right? This is, again, that pop that we saw with the a release of uh, COVID restrictions. They occur basically right here. So you, you get a, uh, a little bit of a pop in export growth as basically China returns to work. This was the biggest increase since then. And people got a little bit excited, but very quickly it emerged, and we discussed it here on uh, the show, that this was largely front-running for the risk that we'd get a Trump administration that would levy tariffs that were still more aggressive than what's already there. So this doesn't look like lasting demand. It looks more like U.S. importers. We got this uh, painted for us, especially in S&P Global and Kai Shin PMI data for October, are trying to front run the tariffs because, of course, it is U.S. importers that pay tariffs not China. Uh, you can't compel a sovereign nation to pay you a tax. That's not how tariffs work. It is just a tax on, it, on imports that's paid by the importers doing the importing. So, because that's who you have jurisdiction over. So, there appears to be front-running of that, and so you get a pop in exports that ultimately doesn't tell you anything about demand being sustainable. So all of this looks awful and uh, the situation doesn't have a clear path toward improvement because, of course, those tariffs are indeed coming. Uh, and uh, the one thing, perhaps, that was consensus between the two sides of the U.S. election was a hawkish posture on China. So all of this is, of course, understandably bad, but how bad relative to asset valuations? 
Do we know all of this already? And ostensibly the answer is yes. Has all of this been factored into price action already? Probably to a very significant extent. And we start to see that appear in Citigroup's economic surprise index for China, which quietly over the course of the past two months or so has wiggled up here north of the zero line, suggesting that economic data out of China is starting to surprise positively relative to forecasts. Now, we've seen this movie before. Uh, this is not anything to uh, scream about just yet, but it does suggest that a level of exhaustion has appeared, at least in economists' models, where they are calling for weakness that isn't being confirmed by reality. If Chinese economic data is starting to uh, more routinely print better than expected, what that says is that the benchmarks that market economists have for what China's economy should be doing are more pessimistic than actual results are endorsing, which tells you that there is surprise risk to the upside now as you get official PMI data that's due to cross the wires this weekend. Now, much of the market will, uh, of course, uh, be offline other than uh, over-the-counter instruments like, let's say, currencies or, or crypto. Uh, and, of course, liquidity will be very, very thin because of the U.S. holiday Thursday into Friday. Uh, so it remains to be seen whether there will be real uptake of this. But if we consider what is coming in context, we see that we basically have standstill in the recent uh, numbers. As ever, 50 is the center line for uh, purchasing manager index data, where over 50 is growth, under 50 is contraction. The further you go above 50, the, fur the faster the growth. The further you go below 50, the faster the contraction. And what you see over recent months is basically both the manufacturing side in the red here and the service sector side in the yellow have converged on 50, which is to say the economy is standing still. It's growing a little bit, not much. Here are the numbers from October here. Uh, the pop in composite PMI here to 50.8 is, of course, noticeable. But when we look at the constituent indexes here, we're barely a hair above the neutral line. So we're essentially standing still. The consensus for incoming numbers is we'll basically keep pace in services and we'll get a little bit faster in manufacturing. That probably gives us a wiggle higher in uh, general uh, PMI, the, the composite, but it doesn't look like much beyond the near standstill that we've come to expect. But maybe that's exactly it, is we've come to expect it. Whereas when we look at economic data as it's developed recently, the tendency seems to be to outcomes that are a little bit better than expected. And if we were to get that kind of a thing on this PMI data, we could very well be saying, well, is the negativity exhausted? Maybe so. Maybe there is room for a bit of bottom fishing. Now, to do this in Chinese stock markets and their proxies like uh, the FXI ETF, the ASHR ETF, that seems fraught with danger uh, because, of course, Chinese officialdom has shown a uh, capacity to move those things basically by decree. So those things can get jumpy and illiquid and in any case don't have to be necessarily responsive to the business cycle because at least recently it seems they can be mandated. So looking where there is perhaps some exposure opportunity. The first stop is the Australian dollar. My personal favorite uh, 
proxy asset for what's going on in China. Uh, Australia, of course, uh, looks to China as its largest export market and ships to China very business cycle sensitive sort of things. Australia's biggest exports are coal. That's, of course, energy production and iron ore, which is a critical input for steel, which is, of course, another major, major input into Chinese value add industry, really the core of the economy. And so with that in mind, we look here at something that is understandably very sensitive uh, to China's business cycle that has had a long sell-off here, thanks to uh, the hawkish rethink in Fed policy expectations, but which is now kind of idling here Nominally setting lower lows, but momentum indicators are diverging, suggesting the capacity for this to keep closing down is fading. Now, that may lead to a period of consolidation before the next leg lower, or it may lead to a bounce. But if that's by itself, but if we were to get positive data out of China, that could well be the catalyst to give us the nudge we need to get through the top of this range right here and then end up somewhere on the way to recovery perhaps toward the 66 figure and if we can clear 6623 here perhaps to this larger inflection zone around 67 it's not quite an actionable setup at the moment but if we were to come up off 64.43 here and cross back over 64, uh, 80, 90 into 65, something more considerable might well be underway. The other interesting asset uh, in this story is copper, of which China is the biggest buyer, and which is also uh, emerging uh, over recent years as a kind of proxy for China's business cycle. And here, what you see is a kind of stalling at familiar lows near the $4 mark. Again, we don't have confirmation yet. You'd want a push through this congestion area right here that uh, lines up to uh, something in the vicinity of, let's call it, 4 and 30 cents, give or take, 435. If we were to get through that, well, then perhaps we have a bounce in copper on the menu as well. And that is macro money for today and for the week. It's an abridged week for uh, the show because of the holiday. We return Monday next week, right after overtime, a show that I co-host with Dylan Radigan and Chris Vecchio looking at the Wall Street close and where things may go there from. On a normal week, I am also on with Victor Jones on Wednesdays for the Price of Truth, uh, the Futures Power Hour with Chris Mondays and Fridays, not this week, but next, uh, and uh, writing for the news and insights portion of tastylive.com. Incidentally, a version of this analysis will be posted there before too long in written form, if you want to catch up. I'm also commenting on the platform formerly known as Twitter and on Blue Sky recently, uh, at Ilya Spivak. If you're watching this on YouTube, like and subscribe. Macro Money's back next week. Have a lovely Thanksgiving if you are celebrating. Happy trading.